The colors are very vibrant and life-giving to me. The beauty of them is wonderful. It gives that grandeur. The stained glass tells stories. It has religious meaning. It brings the past into the present and into the future. And that's what makes stained glass unique. You see a touch of humanity in them. It speaks to the human heart, the human spirit. It does bring it all together. Flowers of the Church, Minnesota Stained Glass Heritage, is funded in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, and by the members of Prairie Public. There's not a lot of written history on how stained glass got here. I think as the area grew, the population grew, there was a need for it, both ecclesiastically and, and residentially and commercially. It was in vogue. The original purpose of the stained glass windows when they were developed was nobody had books, nobody could read, so the story was told in these pictures in the window, whether it be symbol or actual figures. It's not static. It pushes us into being living beings of nurturing and creating and moving toward, toward that goal of being one in the risen Lord. I wanted it to be a window of vibrancy and of movement, incorporating everything about who we are as a community of faith, to be able to look at the window and be reminded of who we really are. The vibrancy of the color glass and the clarity of it all is extraordinary. The browns and the grays are kind of the local soil of Stearns County, and the water and the oil is the gold and stuff. It brings up new life and creating an ambience of joy, and a mission, a sense of direction, and I'm calling it Sacrament Way, where disciples of Jesus followed the way, His way. Catalogs were put out by most of the major studios, and they might have two catalogs. You might have more of a residential, uh, commercial catalog, as well as an ecclesiastical catalog. Some community was building a small church. They wanted some decorative glass. They could look at the catalog and see what it looked like and what was available and what it cost. From that point, the windows could be either fabricated from dimensions, or perhaps the salesman would get on the train and go out there and see them if it was a significant enough job. They also had color samples of the glass and symbols printed in the book. The real early stuff was what we call a cathedral tint. It was a colored glass, but it was somewhat transparent. Around the 1880s, Tiffany and Lafarge developed the early opalescent glass. They would take multiple colors, mix them together, and then put white in it and mix it up so that you got a very high surface color. That became very, very popular, especially in the Midwest. A lot of the glass really hasn't changed that much. You can match 100-year-old glass exactly. They still make the same product. The lead, on the other hand, I know when I first got in the business, we used chemical grade virgin lead. It was a nice, clean, and easy lead to work with. However, it had a tendency to oxidize. The new leads have tin, antimony, copper, other exotic traces of metal in them that makes them much more stable. That will keep the lead from oxidizing. My father was an architectural designer at Cold Spring Granite, did a lot of liturgical designing with granite at that point. In 1959, when they were building the church windows at St. John's Abbey Church, he spent a year and a half out there and the monks and other artists on campus were building the windows in an old barn. They imported all the glass from Europe and actually fabricated the windows. He worked there for about 10 more years doing church fabrications all over the country. 
he just really found himself in love with the glasswork and went on his own with the blessings of Cold Spring Granite. And that's how he got into the business. He passed away rather suddenly and back in 1979. I had worked with him for a couple of years. My brothers had worked with him. So we knew how to do the craft work and learned how to do painting and some of the firing at some of the more intricate church work. When the church was being built, Marcel Breuer was the architect. They were trying to figure out who would do the stained glass windows. One of the uh, professors in the art department, they came up with the particular design that was there. After they came up with the design, they put the windows together. The window itself, the theme, in the very center, there's a prominent window in white that represents the eye of God. Surrounding that central area, there's a prominent red as the lifting up our hearts in praise to God. And then there's lines that run through the window, and those lines represent the different seasons of the church year of Advent, Christmas, Lent, Pentecost. When my dad passed away, I was going to be a school teacher. My brother, Tom, uh, was working at the St. Cloud Hospital. It was a project coming over from Italy, and it was halfway over on the boat when he passed away. So that was our first intention, and we left the door open. And as a result of working in it over the six-month or eight-month period that we were finishing things up, it really started feeling like this is something that we could really do. We loved working with our hands. You have to love that for one thing that mind-hand relationship. And we loved working in churches. We loved the clientele we worked with. We feel that our work in stained glass is rather meaningful, and it's appreciated by a lot of people for generations. I'm the sixth generation in this town. My great-great-great-grandfather was the original settler, and he gave the land with which the church actually sets on. This church, being the oldest consecrated church in the state, should stay more historical. It kind of ties the new in with the old by keeping the stained glass. To me, it's the purple and the blue at the bottom that I remember as a kid always focusing on, down in the clover leaf that are in the bottom of the window. It's just kind of a beautiful color. You'd wonder how you can get that out of glass. The influence of the Benedictines is very prevalent in this space, and we're very conscious of the art and keeping things simple. The sun shining through the stained glass windows, especially some of the bright red glass, it's so beautiful, it's so magical. It's like God's presence, His beauty shines through. It creates a very peaceful, very serene environment. We have three children. Our youngest was baptized here, our children received their sacraments here, and all three of them were married here. It feels like home, and it's just part of our life. We never do a church work unless we've been in the church. We'll know what's the south side, west side, east side, north side of the church. You may want to use a certain hue. Do you put a little different value on it depending on the sun coming in, that type of thing? You have that ability to just control your environment. Sometimes we've been into churches where maybe there's 20 people on a committee and sometimes there's two or three or four people on a committee. We've had where they've been diametrically opposed. On one hand, they'll be looking at traditional windows and in the same committee, they're looking at more of the modern kind of church work. Oftentimes what we'll do is present them with two or three different designs, maybe a little more of the traditional, maybe a little more in between, and then one a little bit more modern. You try to help guide them, and you talk about your experiences and their idea what their heritage might want for their church. They're speaking not only for themselves, but for their ancestors and for people who are coming in the future. The people that came here to the U.S. in those early years came for the religious freedom from Germany. That was very important, and it's been important through our family all the way through. The windows at the previous church, which were put up in the 40s, 
Um, they, they were built basically for that style of church. That's how the decision was made then that we should go ahead and put new stained glass windows in the front of the church here. I look at them every time I come and worship. It definitely gives me a good feeling. The window behind the altar and the altar were really part of congregational members' heritage and it made it easier for some of the older members to make the move to the new building. The Bible is the Word of God. We wanted that to be a significant part of it. The sacraments of communion and holy baptism that's all tied together and that's the significance of the open Bible that we hear the word for people to continue to grow in their faith through the word. Stained glass as a rule tries to harmonize with the architecture of the building. Contemporary buildings that are being built, contemporary glass. However, in the last 10 years, a little bit more of a swing back to traditional looks. A lot of people like to be able to identify what's going on in the window. Some of the abstract windows are colorful, they're bright, they can even be symbolic, but they're a little harder to relate to for a lot of people. Some of the buildings are being built a little bit in kind of a transitional look. Not traditional, but not abstract. There's a lot of reuse of old windows into new structures. The previous churches that we've had built over the years, the original structure uh, um, that was built in the late 1900s had stained glass windows and we incorporated them into the new structure that was built in 1980. We also put some new stained glass windows in that structure, but when we built this structure in 2000, we did not have any stained glass windows. And it was something that we always wanted to, but we had to stay within budget. We're very fortunate that we have good, generous people in our parish. People stepped forward and the stained glass windows were actually paid for before they were put in. One of the previous altars showed the Last Supper, and that was one thing that we wanted to incorporate into the new stained glass windows. It's really all about Jesus instituting the first Mass, the breaking of the bread, sharing it with his disciples, the sharing of the cup. And we do that at every Mass here, and that's what it's all about. The symbols really stand out. Certain times of the day, they just seem to glow. And then there's other times towards the evenings where you just look around the whole entire church and see how all the stained glass windows come together. People really gravitate towards the stained glass because it has this lasting quality about it. Stained glass is the flower in the church. It plays with light, it plays with color, it plays with design, it plays with meaning, it plays with the story of our heritage, of our religion. So it speaks to ancestors, it speaks to our heritage, it speaks to our future kids' generations. It's alive. It's almost organic. The person that had worked with Terhar, his artist, she was a young girl in the parish at that time. And now she works with Terhar as, as the artist and puts that all together. So I knew her very well. And it was a lot of ideas that she came up with that really are outstanding within that whole set of windows. The reason why I was so intrigued and really grabbed onto the glass painting is because we went to Mass three times a week. I stared at those stained glass windows, thinking about who the artist was who, who designed those windows, why they chose those colors, why they did this, why they didn't do that. The sunlight would come through the windows so beautifully. I've always wanted to just spread that light that I saw. I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Industrial Design. I started talking with Gary. I brought in my portfolio and he liked what he saw and said he needed a painter. And I had never painted on glass before, had no idea what it entailed. 
the color of the stained glass and the meaning of the symbols, um, the attraction of it, you know, can certainly pull one into a prayerful mode, into a contemplative mode. In the morning, the bright sun is really piercing. So residents or visitors will ask to sit on the right side of the chapel when they come for Mass. One of our residents went to our fund development director and said, I feel at home in the chapel and this is a place of real peace for me. It prompted her to make a contribution to pay for stained glass windows. The Benedictine cross for us symbolizes our heritage, which is St. Benedict Center's heritage. And one of the things about St. Benedict's rule and foundation is that all shall be treated as Christ, particular care for the sick. And so the cross in itself exemplifies that image for us. The colors have real significance. There's a blue line that ties all those panels together, the principle of life for all of us, and it's the waters of baptism. The little circles that you see in there are the oil which is used for the healing. I do sometimes incorporate the architectural aspects of the church with the window. If they have existing stained glass windows, do they want those to coordinate with the new windows? Do you want them traditional? Do you want them contemporary? Do you want movement? Do you want it to be inspiring? Do you want images? Do you want symbols? I write down what words they come up with. We want it to be peaceful, we want it to be meditative, we want it to glow or be inspiring, spiritual, nature. They might want something more didactic with the story or Jesus and the apostles. Once the illustration is okayed, I get the dimensions of the window, put that in my computer, enlarge my illustration to that size and print out eight and a half by 11 sheets and then I tape all those pieces of paper together. I have a drawing laying on my table at home. I put my piece of glass on my drawing and do all my trace lines. Those are done with a calligraphy pen and I use oil and the paint is actually a powder and you mix it with a palette knife. I get all my thin lines done and then I fire it. After it's fired, I turn my piece over and I do just a flat mat on the back with water base and the paint, and then it dries and it turns back to powder. So then what you do is you lift the powder off the glass. I usually do stippling, so I have some really soft brushes that I will stipple onto the face and it pulls the powder off. I would fire it after that first mat, my second mat on the back side, I would do all shadowed areas, and then I fire it again. And then I flip it over to my front side and start working on that, and then I fire it, and then I do all my shadowing. I do two layers on the back, four layers on the front. And I just love adding that eye color because I'm working with the face for so long. You just can't wait to put that color in the eyes because it really is what makes them look alive. In this business, you have to have a sense of what works with other kinds of colors. You can ruin a good design by putting in bad color. Each glass, and especially when you're talking about some of the opalescent glasses, uh, has a certain uh, color tone to it. We'll have certain kind of glass which has maybe a certain whiter part or a little pinker part or green or blue. We will pick out certain parts of a sheet of glass that we think is going to flow into this particular part of the scene. We'll go to that middle and cut that middle out because that's the right glass. That is constantly on our mind when we're working. What element of glass, what the quality of that glass, what the color of that glass, what the line of that glass is gonna be. If that fits within that particular part of that window design. It's almost a creative process the congregation has been able to see. They started to do some fundraising and a lot of, uh, over those 10 years, uh, people's memorials and just special gifts have gone to the stained glass windows and when enough money comes in, they order the window and it gets installed. It has that contemporary feel to it of being very open to nature. 
you have the windows that look out on the world, but then above you have this beautiful stained glass, which like when we look up to heaven, we kind of see more of that dream we have for a beautiful life. It's all centered on the cross. You have a symbol of baptism and you have a symbol of communion, usually on either side of the cross, reminding us of those sacraments. And with these windows, I like the, the fish, how those multicolored fish are in that blue water and reminding us of that symbol of we're fishers of men and fishers of humans and we're that bright, beautiful spot in that big sea called the world. If you look back in early windows and in contemporary windows, a lot of the story of the life of Christ or, or the Old Testament or saints is pretty much the same. They're treated differently. Contemporary windows, sometimes you have to look a little harder to find the symbol. It's not as graphic, it's not portrayed as in its traditional form, but it's still there. Sometimes color plays an important part. We want to create a space here that as soon as you come into the parking lot, you realize that you're coming into something different. I was really interested in making sure that we have a lot of glass. There was this idea that we're on a journey. The blue would represent water, the browns and the greens would represent the land, and there'd be some sky. And then there were little dots. Those are representative of people at different places in the journey. The faith journey would be that we don't know where the sacred ever begins or ends in our lives. I cannot box it up. It was continuing to invite you in. And even when you got into the space, you could see beyond the space. God didn't create the world black and white. God created it with color so that we could enjoy the beauty and wonder of it. And none of those colors contradict each other. It's fluid. And depending on where I'm going and how difficult the journey is or how easy the journey is from time to time, it reflects my faith journey. A lot of the stained glass windows that we fabricated for churches were derived from memorial money. Uh, somebody passes away, they wanted to give a gift to the church to remember the loved one. They wanted something they could look at and identify with. Sometimes they would do a fundraiser, sometimes it would be in the budget. We worked with Terhar. The designer, Christine, she was wonderful. We took probably six different um, pro, you know, configurations that she had put together, and we pulled things from every one of them that we liked. The trumpets that you see in the window are actually something that a gentleman from our church designed. We've used that as our symbol from the very beginning. We wanted it to be centered around our mission statement which is to grow in faith, love, and service in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to extend God's welcome to all. The best thing about it was that people came out almost of the woodwork and donated money. We have a family that wanted to buy the heart and wanted to buy the rejoice and the mustard seed in the hands, and that all meant something to them. The fish is very sentimental to us. My dad was a big walleye fisherman, and so we worked hard to get that to to look like a certain, you know, almost like a walleye. It's become more of a craft than a fine art. There's a, a tremendous awareness of the glass. It'll bring inspiration. I mean, when we had 9-11, everybody's going back to church and I kept thinking, yeah, you know, I hope our windows bring them a little peace or solace. Somebody once referred to um, stained glass as painting with light, and that's really what you were doing. As we were young children, we'd go in and a lot of times, we may not listen to the homily, but we're looking at the stained glass and wondering how that was made or what the meaning of it is, and just looking at the different colors. So even as young children, they're enjoying it, appreciating it. The future holds well for stained glass.
Flowers of the Church, Minnesota's Stained Glass Heritage, is funded in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, and by the members of Prairie Public. To order a copy of this program, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org.